All right, good morning everybody. Tell us in the comments where you're tuning in from. Welcome to our presentation about monarchs and migration from Phil Hardwicker Park Conservancy. We're really looking forward to sharing with you this. We just wanted to let you know Phil Hardwicker Park is a member-based, um, donation-based program that um, relies on contributions in order to make to, uh, programs like today's possible. So if, um, if you, we finish the program and you decide that you're interested in um, prolonging programs like the today's, um, you're welcome to go check out our website and make a donation. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Drake White. This is our Butterfly Learning Center. and. Um, and you're welcome to ask any questions that you have in the comments. We'll answer questions as the talk goes on. And let's go ahead and get started. This is Drake White, and she'll be presenting about monarchs and migration. So Drake, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. We are here at the Butterfly Learning Center. Um, this is a project that I designed and, and installed here with the um, support of the Texas Master Naturalist and the Phil Harbor Park Conservancy. The Butterfly Learning Center is basically a place to come and learn about native plants as well as different um, species of wildlife, whether it be butterflies or other insects, birds, whatever, because it's all here. Um, today we're going to talk about monarch, monarchs and migration. Um, the monarchs, and we'll kind of wander through and check out some different things, and I'll show you a lot of things that are really good um, to plant for your spaces if you're trying to plant for monarchs um, and believe it or not if you kind of look around <laughs> we're in a lot of shade so if you have shady spots that's okay you can still plant for monarchs and it still works so the monarch butterfly um, is the only butterfly known so far um, that does a two-way migration like birds so they travel every season um, right now they're in migration coming down from Canada going back to Mexico They will overwinter in Mexico and then they will in spring um, Wake up start mating and journey their way back um, To the States and all the way back up to Canada um, How do we know this? Well, we know this because There's a thing that's called a tag and the tag has a little tiny number on it that keeps record and how we know that is because when it's been done, it's 1973, I believe, is when or 78, um, is when it started. Um, and they started making all these different uh, changes and looking and studies to make sure that one, that tag was not toxic to the butterfly. So a lot of research has gone. It's not a GPS like a lot of people think. It's really just a number. And so what they do is they tag these. And then the indigenous people there collect them off the forest floor. And for each one they turn in, they get $5. Um, now a lot of people kind of freak out because they're like, oh, well, hey, they're probably stealing butterflies. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. So in order for them to actually receive this, um, the butterfly has to be proven that it is done and died of natural causes. So all its parts needs to be there. <laughs> Um, they do test on it to make sure that it was a natural cause. So it is a good citizen science um, research project. Us ourselves as citizen science can also do that. Um, how do you do it? Well, you can go to monarchwatch.org <coughs> and you can read and learn a lot about um, different ways to, to help um, build habitat, to also tag yourself. Um, we're actually having an up-and-coming Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival here for San Antonio. It's the city's um, festival each year. Uh, so you can go there and have yourself educated on different things there as well. But one of the biggest things is, is learning different habitat and what you actually need. So monarchs, they need milkweed. And milkweed is a plant that a lot of people don't necessarily look at as well especially farmers maybe not necessarily look at it as a welcoming plant um, it is a plant that is needed in order for the monarch butterfly um, to survive they can't eat anything else um, and they need it and there's several different species but they need it to not just get nectar but that's what they the babies eat the caterpillars so it is considered what's called a host plant and a host plant 
is any type of plant for any type of caterpillar because every caterpillar whether it's a moth whether it's a butterfly it is host plant specific so example would be if I find a black swallowtail caterpillar I cannot take it and put it on milkweed it won't eat it it can't eat it and vice versa the host plant for that is actually parsley or fennel or dill like we have kind of over here to our right there or left my other right <laughs> um, that is for the um, black swallowtails so monarchs can't eat that they can only eat milkweed so if we plant milkweed and we place them in our um, habitats then we're more likely to have them and help conserve the numbers that they need um, another thing that is really kind of hard for some folks um, is the use of pesticides pesticides are not just bad for um, the caterpillars or other insects it's just very indiscriminate so if you're kind of using a pesticide to kill something else it's not going to say oh wait that's a monarch or oh wait that's a caterpillar for butterfly for this um, it's not gonna know and it's it's if you're trying to kill one thing it's gonna end up kind of killing everything um, so our use of pesticides should really just diminish um, altogether and then we don't have to worry about that a lot of things too that people don't think about when using pesticides is that 78% um, of the diet for hummingbirds is actually insects a lot of people think that it's sugar water or that it's nectar, but it's actually not, it's insects. So when you're using that pesticide and there's, you know, dead insects around on the floor and they feed it or they eat it and they feed it to their babies, now we're harming a whole chain of different things. So um, when we're trying to um, stop something for monarchs, let's say, yes, we don't want to use the pesticides for monarchs, but in turn, it actually helps the whole ecosystem all around. So we want a good balance and we want to make sure that we're helping everything, but really it's the monarch is kind of like the gateway <laughs> butterfly, insect, um, to kind of learning about everything else. Because even when you're planting specific plants, you're actually planting for other things as well. And through my whole journey in this thing, um, I have actually learned that. I was never really like a bird person, but I'm lear learning a lot more about birds and their behaviors and what they do because I planted for the monarch, um, which then became an obsession. <laughs> and then here I am today. So um, I encourage you as well. We're just gonna kind of walk through and look at some things that um, may be helpful to you if you're not aware of, of different types of plants um, that you can use that are, we'll talk right here in this section about nectar plants. Um, really great nectar plants. This right here is flame acanthus. And as you can see, it's really brightly colored in red. Um, this blooms um, typically in mid spring all the way until we have a first frost. If we don't have a long enough frost, it will stay evergreen. Um, but it's literally one of those ones that you plant it, water it in, and completely forget it. Never water it again, and it's happy. And as you can see with all the flowers that it has, this is all the flowers it's got on it, even though that we're in partial shade. So this grows completely great in full sun or in partial shade as well. Over here, we have Mealy Blue Sage. This is a favorite of many many plant or uh, pl this plant is a uh, favorite of many butterflies um the monarchs love it the um as you can see whoop, there's some that are coming to it right now um little skippers all types of butterflies absolutely love this hummingbirds go crazy over this as well as the flame acanthus if you like hummingbirds oh my goodness that's like one you must have because it's definitely um a good attractant for hummingbirds they fight over it we do have a question yes from mary jo waldorf from the virgin i believe it's about the flame acanthus asking what is its common name that is its common name <laughs> yep flame acanthus is its common name um i can give the um i can i'll put later in the comments um when it's on the replay 
I'll put its scientific name um, in there for you guys. Uh, then another really good one. I gotta watch where I go so I don't trip. Uh, here that does really super well in shade, in full shade, um, part shade and full sun. This is Zexmania. And this is a wonderful, wonderful plant for nectar, but it's also a host plant. So out of these three plants that I just showed you, um, three of the, or two of them are host plants for other butterflies. So sometimes you get a bonus. Sometimes it's a host plant and sometimes it's a nectar plant. But this is also a great one. As I kind of journey up over this way, we're going to notice that, hey, even within the gardens, good uh, native grasses are great. But this plant right here, this is one of the main nectar sources. This is out of my habitat and my own spaces. This is the nectar of choice during fall migration um, for the monarch butterflies. They need more than anything they need during the fall to have flowers that are ready for them. So this is kind of what I like to tell folks. When you're getting ready, you want them to be ready for migration. Um, if you're just starting in the fall, plant some of your um, nectar sources, but also plant milkweed. Each season, spring and fall, spring and fall. So whatever you have, um, you sh so for example, if you wanted it to be ready for fall migration, it should have been planted in spring. And in the fall, you'll plant for spring's flowers that they'll need, um, which would be their host plants and nectar plants as well. So if you're doing some of both, in both seasons, you'll be good. And you can never, 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 never have enough milkweed, in my opinion. <laughs> you'll always need more because as they come in, um, they'll, they'll lay more and you'll need more food because they can eat a lot. So always um, just supply yourself, have enough supply for them uh, to eat, uh, their babies to eat. But this you can't go wrong with. This is a great nectar source for everything. This is frost weed. It does well in full sun or full shade. Um, when you have this, typically June 1st, you would want whatever height that it is, you would want to cut it back by half. That way it doesn't get too long and leggy. And then when the bloom starts, it gets top heavy and falls over. So um, if you cut it back, it helps to kind of stout it out and you can um, have a more sturdy and more full plant that has more blooms. <clears throat> This is also a host plant, so you kind of get a double bonus. The um, border patch will use this as a host plant as well. So as well as common sunflower, but they will use this. So you get a double bonus um, with this one as well. So over here, we'll talk about some um, milkweed vines. So we have here, this is Taliote milkweed vine. And the Taliote milkweed vine and over here is fringed twine vine. So these were freshly just planted. These two are ones that the monarchs and the queens both will use. There's also pearl milkweed back over behind the, um, up along the fence. This is pearl milkweed right here. So. How you can kind of tell the difference between the two, three species, actually, if you look at this leaf, if you kind of touch it, underneath, it's a little bit rough, um, but the top is very soft and a little bit fuzzy. This also has a heart-shaped leaf. So this will tell me that, hey, you know what, without even seeing a flower, this here is the pearl milkweed vine, just by the shape of the leaf. Pearl milkweed vine isn't used very much as a host plant, but it definitely is used um, as a nectar source by other insects. If I come here and I look at this leaf here, I can kind of see where this is lobed, but right at where the stem meets the actual leaf of the plant, I see that it has a flat space and then it has lobes. This tells me that this is Taliote milkweed vine. Now this vine is actually, well, and look at here, we have an egg. 
we have an egg right there hopefully that <laughs> that is an egg of either the uh, monarch or the queen here's another egg right there so you see it completely live <laughs> this is one that is used by the monarch queen and the soldier butterfly um, all three of those will use this plant um, which is the Teleode milk revine please I cannot even pronounce it correctly the actual I will so butcher it if I try to say the scientific name but that's another one that I will put in the comments um, later on once it goes back into replay um, and then over here on the fringed so these leaves here you can tell are much longer these are deeper lobed and like a longer heart shape so these are very um, soft to the touch but not fuzzy so you can see these are longer but yes still long lobed like a very long heart um, similar to the um, teleode but it's missing the flat part so that's how I also know. Also, this one has a little kind of skunky smell to it. Um, so that one definitely, I'm trying to look and see if we have any eggs on this. Um, that is how, anyway, we tell how that the difference between the three species by just their leaves. This is another one that the monarch and queens will also use um, as a host plant. So having all that is really important and knowing which ones because um, if you're trying to plant for habitat the most frustrating thing I found and I find that other people find is when you're told to plant something um, let's say um, a certain plant and you're like oh wow it's so pretty and I want that but it's actually not attracting what you wanted so learning exactly what you want to attract and what your um, wanting to bring is really really important um, so any type of well those two for host plants for um, monarchs but definitely other milkweeds and I'm gonna just come down over here over here there's a couple different varieties of milkweed the one variety that I really want to talk about is careful where I step so these right here, these are the Asclepius tuberosa, common name called butterfly weed. So if you notice its height, notice how short it is, how long the leaves are, how narrow the leaves are. This is one of the most common mistaken plants for tropical milkweed. They will um, sometimes in nurseries, or a lot of times in nurseries, called butterfly weed, and it's actually tropical milkweed. And tropical milkweed will be in this one gallon plant that's like two, three foot tall, real bushy. If it's that way in the pot, it is not a native. Um, it is the tropical milkweed. Um, and the problem with that is, is one, the germination rate of that that can actually spread out and get into our natural areas and it grows really, really good and really, really fast. The problem is it will crowd out our natives, but it also doesn't die back in the summer like our natives does. And sometimes here, it doesn't die back in winter either because we don't have a harsh enough winter for it to do that. So that means that it is actually carrying the OE spore during spring and fall migration if we're not cutting it back and doing it. So if it's something that you already have in your habitat and you don't necessarily want to pull it out and get rid of it, um, you definitely want to care for it correctly. That way that you're having um, clean, healthy plants available for the monarchs to continue their um, migration, both for spring and for fall migration. Um, another thing that I can teach you with this plant is that if we come back down here real quick. Oh, sorry, spider. Let me go over here. Don't want to disrupt the spider. So, if you actually take a leaf and you pull one leaf off, you will see there is nothing coming out. So, if you do that on another milkweed, you're going to have the milkweed sap. 
that comes out which is really really toxic so if you like even right now even though that didn't show very much there is that toxic sap in there I just can't see it so I'm gonna make sure that I don't touch my face I don't rub my eyes or wipe the sweat off my brow because I can get that in my eye and it is a very toxic and painful um, needs to be treated by a medical professional um, so I'm gonna make sure that I wash my hands and it's snowing <laughs> it's snowing little seed droplets um, next year's plants yes over here um, we have zizotes this is zizotes milkweed this one's getting ready to bloom and this one is already starting to bloom so these are nice healthy established um, plants and these are really really good so knowing to how the height the different heights and and which ones really grow well together there's um, another set in here um, the Texas milkweed I'm not quite sure where it went but it's it's in here as well those three and antelope horn so there's Texana the Zizotis the um, butterfly weed um, and the milkweed vines um, that do really really well in antelope horn that do, do all do well here for Bear County you should wherever you're at in whatever county that you're in find out which ones do the best for your area because um, it's really frustrating when you have put something in and it doesn't necessarily grow well so an example I can give with that is for Texas, um, the uh, uh, common milkweed is native. It's native here. Um, however, in Bear County, it does not grow well. And that's because we're very hot and humid. Um, and it is a very cold loving milkweed. So it's more native, yes, to Texas, but it's native to like the Oklahoma border. It will do fabulous there where it's much colder for much longer. Here, it just does not seem to want to grow. I've tried it a million times and it grows. And as soon as we get 90, 95 degrees, it looks like somebody set it on fire. <laughs> it's done. It's not happening. So really don't waste your money on it um, because it's not going to grow well for you uh, if you have it. But all these other ones, they grow full sun and partial shade. Um, and so it's it's easier if you know what you're um, looking to plant and what you want to plant maybe you have a color scheme um, so the tuberosa their flowers are orange um, like a yellowish orange but more orangey um, and the zizotes is white um, the um, texana is also white I'm gonna go over here there is the green antelope corn it's dormant right now, um, which this time of the season, that's normal um, for this one to be finished and go dormant. But we do have right here, as you can see, the, the stem is all nice and dried up. And this actually still had leaves and flowers on it um, about three weeks ago. So, uh, but now it's, it's finished it's done, and it will show itself again next year. Um, that is another one that is really easy it, green antelope horn or the regular antelope horn those are a lot of the favorite for a lot of folks these actually do the absolute best when grown directly from seeds so if you want the majority or a lot of those just direct sow direct sow those seeds um, and when would you want to do that a lot of people don't know when do you do it um, so the best time to direct sow seeds would be like October all the way through December um, through the winter by mid January if you haven't gotten them down um, you're kind of pushing it you could but if that's optimal time is October through mid January um, if you're trying to grow them from seed like in pots then one of the things here in, in, that I have learned and I had never done in the past because it re you really don't have to is cold stratification so in other areas you would have to cold stratify but since if they're native and we're getting them from here it doesn't necessarily need it 
But what I learned this year through our little snow vid that we had <laughs> is that um, you have a better success. So I typically would put them out in their trays and, and start growing them. I never, ever, ever cold stratified. But this year, I had other things to be um, kind of watching over and taking care of. And I completely forgot my trays of the um, seedlings that I was starting. And so none of them had actually um, uh, sprouted yet. And so I just left them out like, okay, I only had so much room in the greenhouse. We'll just leave those out and we'll start over when it's finished. Well, this was the first year that I had every single one. Typically, I would have out of a 50 cell um, pack that I would start, I would have about a quarter of it that would do. So I would pick and choose and plant them and pot them up and, and whatnot. But this year, because of it, and it's literally just one week, <laughs> one week of being freezing cold and every single one sprouted so i was beyond like wow okay this is what you have to do even though you don't have to but your success rate is so much higher um so you don't have to do anything fancy literally take your seeds throw them in the freezer for a week and then direct sow your chances are probably so much better than um, at a higher germination rate. Um, so, how am I doing on time? You're doing great. We actually have a question. Okay. Um, Talat Shah asks, do you need to provide trellises for the milkweed vines? I have a small pearl milkweed without a support. Yes, so you definitely want some type of, of trellis, um, especially for the milkweed vines, because they can't, once they get established, they can really, really climb. So, um, starting to train it now, but even if you have one that's small, you'll want to get something kind of high, a higher trellis or even um, an arched trellis if you can um, to put that on. Otherwise, it will kind of tie up around um, other plants and you don't want them to necessarily choke them out. If you're out in the natural areas, out in the park, then you'll typically see it climbing on the fences or climbing up the sides of trees um, that, that can support it the weight of that plant but maybe if you have it mixed in with some other plants it might not be able to take the weight off of that plant so yes definitely give it something to climb on um, that can hold the weight of that um, so as we, as we learn about the different um, migration patterns typically uh, monarchs, right now, we're having a um, early migration, <clears throat> and it's not typical. Typically here in, in um, San Antonio, we're seeing the migration usually around now starting to come through. Um, but we started having it come through around mid-August. Um, and some of the other uh, experts and scientists we're seeing some of the same things even up north. Um, this whole year has been kind of weird um, with a lot of different um, things happening within different insects and birds. And um, some things are early, some things are late, some things never left. <laughs> um, so it's trying to get a good balance and, and learn. But typically, now is when we would start seeing the migration start happening. Mid-September, um, they usually start coming through and they go all the way by December, they're usually gone um, and already down into Mexico. They start back up again in spring and then um, start mating and then head their way back up here, which is usually around April-ish. Um, we can never control Mother Nature, but that's typically um, when it starts to happen. Um, and um, we want to make sure that we have their, their habitat. If you want to become a citizen science scientist, it's so easy. Um, it's not hard. It's really just observing, learning the plants that you need, both nectar and host plants, um, to plant for them, and to give them maybe some, you know, a water, um, make a puddle patch for them. 
that's a whole nother <laughs> learning. We have one over here um, up in the corner. It's just a place for them to collect their minerals that they need in order to mate and continue migrating as well. Um, so creating the habitat that they need is really, really important. Having a water source, having a mineral source and host plants. Clean, no use of pesticides, um, no use of herbicides. Um, those are the things that we want to make sure that we incorporate into our habitats. Do we have any other questions? Uh, no other questions, although Mary, Mary Jo Waldorf from Virgin says about the freezer. Thanks for the tip. You're welcome. Yes. Um, it doesn't have to be hard. It's very intimidating sometimes, and especially if you tried it multiple times and you just have no success or they start growing and then they just kind of deafen off and die. Um, it's frustrating, but when you learn something that works, it's, it's a lot, it's helpful. And it's just, you know, be okay with sometimes it's not just going to, that's the whole learning process. And that's what kind of brings you in and gives you the connection um, with nature that you actually would want to have. Um, when you actually have uh, some, some investment in, into it, you learn and appreciate the things around you a little bit more because like I said before when you're planting for one thing like the monarch or um, another specific bird even you're planting for more than just that you end up planting for other things as well because it's all a happy ecosystem right okay. so are we okay on time we've got we're at 9 30 okay um so other things that you can do um, oh, one thing I know that um, a lot of people think that just because they might live in an apartment or they have a townhouse um, or they don't have a planting space, they just have a patio or a very small space to plant in, that they really can't plant a habitat. And that's so not necessarily true. So you can have a whole habitat in one pot. And one of those is if you have like a 16 to 20 inch pot, you can plant three plants in there that are fantastic for the monarchs, fantastic for other insects, and for hummingbirds as well. And those three that go really well together is the Greg's Mist Flower, or any type of Mist Flower, but Greg's Mist Flower definitely, um, a frostweed like you saw back up over there, and a milkweed, either Zizopes or Texana. Those two are the only two that do really, really great in a pot. Um, you don't have to bring it in. You can leave the whole thing out when it's winter and it's a, if it's going to freeze. Um, it's still fine, um, so there's not a lot of care to it. It shouldn't be watered a lot. The only time that it should be watered is when the plant kind of droops, um, which typically is about, well, if it's cooler, it's maybe every couple of weeks, but if it's hotter, then it might be every couple of days. The, the plant will actually tell you when it needs water. Um, but just because you live in a small, small space doesn't mean you need those three plants right there in of itself are enough to sustain and help the mar monarchs during their um, migration. Um, if you have a small space in, you typically want to have enough that you would um, have their food source, ne nectar source, um, space that provides the habitat for them to roost and hide in, as well as the um, caterpillars to hide in um, from predators. And then you're going to start noticing when you have all that, other things will move in. You'll have um, different spiders and lizards and birds um, that all kind of mingle in and create a nice healthy ecosystem. But even in the one pot or a small space, or if you have acreage, I mean, everybody can do their part and can have something that supports um, the butterflies, monarchs, and other um, habitats or other uh, wildlife um, in their habitats. So we have a couple more questions. Marjeska, Marjeska Zellner asks about how long are the egg and caterpillar stages? Okay, perfect question. So typically it's going to depend on how hot we are so in the spring it takes a little bit longer because it's cooler so the hotter it is the faster it is so if we're like right now um a monarch lays an egg and three to five days later the egg is hatched 
Um, and then seven to 10 days, it goes through its cycle and it goes into chrysalis. And then another seven to 10 days, you'll have a butterfly. Um, in the spring, it's a little bit longer than that. So it, the cooler it is, the slower it is. So if you're even, if you're a teacher and you're um, raising a caterpillar for your life cycle studies, um, life cycle science, then typically it'll take longer because it's in a controlled environment that is much cooler. The hotter it is, the quicker it is. But typically um, you have about three to four weeks from the time the egg is laid till you have a butterfly. And then April Thomason asks, can we see Puddle Patch? Yes, the Puddle Patch is right over here. So this here is the Puddle Patch. And it is not anything of what it sounds. <laughs> There's no water collection. It's just basically an area where the um, butterflies come to collect minerals. So a puddling station um, literally is just an area where either with the um, water from the hose that you just lightly water or from rain that falls, the dew in the morning, it's basically this is an area that gets damp and then dries but the trace minerals are left behind and that's what the butterflies need. They need those trace minerals. Males actually need it um, a lot more than females because if they don't have enough of the minerals that they need, they're actually sterile and cannot mate. So whenever you see them near puddles or on the out edges um, in mud puddles or on mulch, if you have a place um, that you've already planted things and you've watered mulch or it's rained and you start noticing butterflies that come out and they're all over the mulch, they're actually collecting those minerals that are left behind and dried up. Um, they need that in order to um, continue their life cycles. And it's really easy. Um, I can, I have a, a, a YouTube channel. I can put the link in there on how to make one too. It's really easy. You just want to keep it in a space that it never kind of moves around. Um, it doesn't even have to be in a container or shaped or anything. It, you can just have a specific spot for it. Um, and as long as it stays in the same spot, it's good. And you're providing something um, very useful for a lot of insects, not even just for butterflies, but a lot of insects will um, use this to collect minerals because butterflies aren't the only ones that actually need um, the minerals as well. And Talat Shah asks, if we have some tropical milkweed, how do we best maintain it for the monarchs or should we eliminate it altogether? So I, ha I get this a lot. My recommendation is just get rid of it. Um, a lot of people don't like to feel they've wasted money if they've already spent money on something and want to allow it to um, die off as its natural life because every plant has a natural lifespan. So if this is the case and this is for you, um, then definitely at least twice a year, it needs to be cut to the dirt. Um, that would be June 1st cut it all the way to the dirt um, and allow it to grow back. This way you know during fall migration you're going to have CLE OE free um, milkweed that is ready for that next generation. Um, and then do it again. I, I like to say October 31st when the kids are trick-or-treating the next morning get up cut your milkweed back again and keep it cut until January 1st especially if we're having a, an extremely warm summer here because we still have monarchs that are migrating through and I'm standing in ants um, and so if we're having them then there still could be some infected OE butterflies and we don't want to keep that going by having unclean milkweed so that's why you want to keep the milkweed cut back until January 1st um, and then typically there are already pretty much already in Mexico um, and it should be fine to let it grow back then. Um, but we don't have the problem with natives, so if you just plant natives and either just pull it out or let it die out, then you won't have this problem because as you can see, um, our natives, they die back in the summer and then they start to grow back in the fall. Um, or some like this one here that I showed you earlier, the, um, the uh, green antelope horn, 
that one won't come back until the spring of next year. So typically that's, that's why we don't have to cut down the, nat the native ones because they naturally die back and give us something that's clean and OE free. Sally Hall asks, what's your YouTube channel name? Um, the Nectar Bar SA. Okay, and uh, Sue Caponegro Wilson asks, so have most of the monarchs already passed through our area? Um, no, they're still here, <laughs> and there's a lot of them. <laughs> so they, they, they just started earlier. We started to see kind of a slight trickle through um, the beginning of August. But now, I mean, and if you have hab any habitat, like I have a very um, good established habitat and I have them by the hundreds in my yard right now for the past week. So you're going to see the really good now all the way through mid-October and then they'll start kind of dwindling out because you'll have this, the late stragglers that kind of come through. Um, so, yeah, no, if you have habitat or you're putting it in or at least put some, if I, if the one thing that I can say is put up nectar or put up plant nectar for them right now because that's what they need. They need a lot of nectar to fuel themselves up to be able to make the journey. But yes, plant milkweed too. Um, that way that's ready for them in the spring during their migration. But they need a lot of nectar um, in order to fatten themselves up to be able to make that journey. Any other questions? Thank you so much for joining us this morning um, and listening and educating yourself on monarchs and migration and the milkweed that is definitely needed for them in order to survive. Um, I appreciate you listening in. Peace, love, and butterflies. Thank you so much for joining us this morning at Phil Hardberger Park. As I mentioned, Phil Hardberger Park is a member-based conservancy that relies on donations from people like you in order to keep our programming going. If you have 5 or $10 to spare and you feel like donating to the conservancy, we would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday.